Chapter 5. Forgetting to Remember the Future ADD is not a problem of knowing what to do. It is a problem of doing what you know. It is not that I wish to be late. I do not imagine for a moment that I will be late. I may have to be somewhere miles away at 9 a.m., but as long as it is not yet 9, I fully believe I have enough time. I am scheduled to attend ward rounds with nurses and other physicians at Vancouver Hospital. At 8.50, I leap into the shower, still confident there is space between the big hand of the watch and the hour marker, so I am not late. That the traveling always takes longer than I expect, that ice will have to be scraped off the car, that I will not find the keys, that I may get stuck in traffic, do not arise in the mind as concrete possibilities. Two thought systems V for control in the brain. The one logical and aware, the other the immature time sense of a child. The latter is most often dominant. It's only when nine o'clock strikes and I'm searching for my keys that irritability begins to set in. When I get outside and realize that the frost has made the windshield completely opaque, I begin to curse. By the time I have to rush back up the stairs once, then twice to find briefcase or lunch or stethoscope, I feel utterly frustrated. I arrive on the ward 15 minutes late on a good day, removing my coat and hat and pulling my rubber galoshes off each foot in turn while hopping hurriedly down the hall on the other. Taking a deep breath outside the door, I steady myself. I enter the meeting room. Rounds are already in progress. Okay, we can begin, I say. I notice that not everyone laughs. Every adult with ADD can relate such anecdotes. Funny to tell, not so funny to experience, and never so jolly for others inconvenienced by the tardiness and disorganization. The ADD mind is afflicted by a sort of time illiteracy, or what Dr. Russell Barkley has called time blindness. One is either hopelessly short of time, dashing about like a deaf bat, or else acts as if blessed with the gift of eternity. It's as if one's time sense never developed past the stage other people leave behind in early childhood. To the very young child, any block of time seems infinite. Tell her that supper will be ready in three minutes. Desperate wailing will signal her conviction that you have sentenced her to starvation. Tell her to hurry because time is running out and she will not know what you are talking about. How can infinity run out? Only two units of time exist for the small child. The now and the not now. The not now is infinity. The time sense of the ADD adult or child is warped in other ways. Ask people with ADD how long it will take to perform a particular task, and they will notoriously underestimate. A kind of magical thinking dominates characteristics of young children. If I will it, it will happen. In magic, anything is possible. Castles can be built or destroyed with the wave of a wand. Worlds traversed in seven league boots you can get from Oz to Kansas by clicking your heels together. Magic vanquishes time. No infant is born with a sense of time. The gradual acquisition of time sense is a task of development that begins in early childhood. At the outset, the infant has no categories such as time, space, or causality, no awareness that one event leads to another. It is not until the age of seven or so, Jean Piaget found that children begin to have a full understanding of time as a continuous flow. Until then, the children is in what Piaget, the great Swiss cognitive psychologist, called the pre-operational stage, when everything is observed and interpreted from only one point of view, the child's. The pre-operational child, in his egocentric manner, believes that he can stop time, speed it up, or slow it down. The networks of nerve cells responsible for the various brain activities do not develop the same way, at the same time or necessarily to the same degree. 
With ADD, we witness a delayed or permanently arrested maturation of the balanced time sense most people achieve by adulthood. In attention deficit disorder, the circuitry of time intelligence is underdeveloped. Underdevelopment best explains another time-related malfunction of the ADD brain, the chronic incapacity to consider the future. The guiding assumption of the adult with attention deficit disorder, like that of a small child, seems to be that only the present exists and needs to be taken into account. He lives as if his actions had no implications for the future, no effects on future needs, relationships, or responsibilities. The short-term goal is invariably chosen over the long term with the exception of activities or projects capable of arousing the sluggish motivation-reward nexus in the brain. The present impulse dominates. It has been aptly said that people with ADD forget to remember the future. In the moment of action or decision-making, ADD adults are no more mindful of consequences than a young child. Some aspects of the individual's mental and emotional functioning are normal for chronological age. Others remain mired in the early childhood phase. He can be so cooperative and mature one minute, and in the next he is behaving like a two-year-old. An exasperated mother will say of her pre-adolescent son, Often I feel like a complete child. Many adults with ADD have told me. Or a wife will complain bitterly that living with her husband is like living with a young child. Sometimes it feels like I'm his mother. It's as if I have three children, two preschoolers and one age 32. The major impairments of ADD, the distractibility, the hyperactivity, and the poor impulse control, reflect each in its particular way a lack of self-regulation. Self-regulation implies that someone can direct attention where she chooses, can control impulses, and can be consciously mindful and in charge of what her body is doing. Like time literacy, self-regulation is also a distinct task of development in human life, achieved gradually from young childhood through adolescence and adulthood. We are born with no capacity whatsoever to self-regulate emotion or action. For self-regulation to be possible, specific brain centers have to develop and grow connections with other important nerve centers and chemical pathways need to be established. Attention deficit disorder is a prime illustration of how the adult continues to struggle with the unsolved problems of childhood. She is held back precisely where the child did not develop, hampered in those areas where the infant or toddler got stuck during the course of development. In general, we speak of the underdevelopment of emotional intelligence. In his best-selling book, Emotional Intelligence, Daniel Goleman, behavioral and brain sciences writer for the New York Times, defines this capacity as being able to motivate oneself and persist in the face of frustration, to control impulse and to delay gratification, to regulate one's moods and keep the stress from swamping the ability to think. We have only to place a negative qualifier before the being able in that sentence, as in not being able, and we arrive at a succinct description of the ADD personality. Reactions can be gratifyingly mature at one time, but distressingly immature at another. If some deeply unconscious anxiety is triggered, a person may respond with a lack of emotional self-regulation characteristic of an infant. A fully grown adult exhibiting the rage of an infant is terrifying and potentially dangerous. We all have experiences as parents that are ashamed of and wish we could erase. Such scenes always represent failures of self-regulation and impulse control. What happens during these times is that the brain centers where the deepest emotions of fear and rage are generated simply overwhelm the higher centers meant to govern them. So-and-so is behaving like a baby is an accurate description of the individual's neurophysiological state at such moments. 
that the infant-toddler mode is so often dominant in attention deficit disorder reflects incomplete development of pathways in the cerebral cortex and between the cortex and lower areas of the brain. Cortex means bark, as in the bark of a tree, and refers to the thin rim of gray matter enveloping the white matter of the brain. Made up largely of the cell bodies of the nerve cells, or neurons, the cortex is where the most highly evolved activities of the human brain are processed. Spread out, it would be about the size and thickness of a table napkin. We can probably localize much of the organic basis of ADD in what is called the right prefrontal cortex, the area of the brain just behind the forehead. The evidence comes from the latest radiological studies, from sophisticated psychological tests, from animal experiments, and from observing human beings who have sustained injury to this part of the brain. In general, the functions of the right prefrontal cortex include impulse control, social emotional intelligence, and motivation. It also participates in the directing of attention. Human beings injured here, so-called prefrontal patients, exhibit distractibility, poor regulation of impulses, and other classical signs of ADD. Monkeys deliberately lesioned in the right prefrontal cortex lose their ability to read social cues and to participate in socially essential activities such as mutual grooming. They are soon ostracized by other members of the group. Neuroimaging studies such as scans and magnetic resonance imaging that reveal the architecture and functioning of the brain structures also implicate the right prefrontal cortex. MRI pictures have shown smaller than normal structures in the prefrontal areas of ADD patients. Another way to study the brain is the use of electroencephalograms, or EEGs, which measure electrical wave activity. EEG studies performed in Edmonton at the University of Alberta have cast some light on how ADD may be reflected in brain functioning. The EEGs of a group of pre-adolescent boys with ADD were compared with those of a matched group of non-ADD peers. The two groups had similarly normal EEGs at rest, but the ADD group showed excessive slow-wave activity during directed tasks such as reading or drawing. As would be expected normally, the non-ADD group had increased fast-wave electrical responses to the same task. In other words, in the ADD group, electrical activity in the cerebral cortex or gray matter slowed down just when it would have been required to speed up. It may be paradoxical to consider that hyperactivity of mind or body can be caused by an underactivity of the cortex. It would also seem odd to think of hyperactivity being stopped by a stimulant medication. The paradox is best understood by means of an analogy. Imagine a busy urban street corner where major thoroughfares converge, each conveying a high volume of traffic. In our model, the drivers had no capacity to regulate themselves. They rely on the order kept by a policeman who ensures that when traffic flows east to west, the vehicles traveling on the north to south axis are stopped until it is their turn to move, and that cars are allowed to take turns in an organized fashion. Traffic flow, in short, is alternatively inhibited in one direction while being permitted in another. There is order. Now imagine that the policeman falls asleep on the job. There will ensue tremendous activity as cars from all directions attempt to move through the intersection. Their drivers increasingly frustrated, their horns joined in a deafening cacophony. Despite all the commotion, there is little progress. Fewer and fewer cars are able to move purposefully. There is disorder. The prefrontal cortex may be seen as that policeman. One of its major tasks is inhibition. It evaluates the myriad impressions, thoughts, sensations, and impulses reaching it from the environment, from the body and from the lower brain centers. It must select what is essential and helpful and inhibit input and impulses that are not useful to the organism in a given situation. 
Our initial response to a stimulus, whether anxiety-producing or pleasurable, is unconscious. It comes not from the cortex, but from lower brain centers where emotions originate. The cortex has a split second to decide whether to give permission to the impulse or to cancel it. One way to understand ADD neurologically is as a lack of inhibition, a chronic underactivity of the prefrontal cortex. The cerebral cortex in the frontal lobe is not able to perform its job of prioritizing selection and inhibition. The brain, flooded with multiple bits of sensory data, thoughts, feelings, and impulses, cannot focus and the mind or body cannot be still. In short, the policeman is asleep. If we want the traffic to move, we need to rouse him. Similarly, the cortex is functioning at a semi-dormant level, as indicated by the EEG finding of slowed activity. Hence the efficiency of stimulant medications, they arouse the inhibitory function. They wake up the cop, alert the underdeveloped and underactive circuitry of the prefrontal cortex. Recognizing that ADD is a problem of development rather than a pathology takes us in a direction completely different from, from that dictated by a narrowly medical approach. When we ask why the medical disorder ADD develops, we are adopting the illness model of ADD. Implied in the illness model is a presence of a pathological entity in the brain, analogous to, say, inflammation of joints and rheumatoid arthritis, or bacterial invasion of the lungs and pneumonia. Such a way of formulating the question of how ADD originates almost demands a medicalized answer. We look for the narrowly biological, exclusively physiological explanation. If we choose not to see ADD as medical disorder or illness, the question of causation is turned around and examined from the opposite angle. Recognizing that time sense, self-regulation, and self-motivation are nature-driven and necessary developmental tasks, we ask the following. What conditions are needed for human physiological and psychological maturation? What conditions would inhibit or interfere with the growth of process? Instead of asking why a disorder or illness develops, we ask why a fully self-motivated and self-regulated human personality does not. Nature, we say, has an agenda for the comparatively long development phase of humans. 18 years or even longer. The maturation of an autonomous, self-motivated individual in harmony with the community and environment that he is a part of. In ADD, the natural agenda is frustrated. Why? Posing the question this way immediately resolves the vexing and confusing issue of how it could be that symptoms of a disorder are distributed so widely among the population even in those without the supposed disorder. Not many human beings are born into ideal situations. Throughout the industrialized world, and particularly in North America, families are under enormous strain from a frenzied lifestyle and the breakdown of traditional supports. Since perfect parenting is almost impossible, there will be partial flaws of development to a greater or lesser degree in just about everyone. So few children grow up in truly optimal circumstances. Stanley Greenspan, a leading American child psychiatrist, has written that we have no idea of what the parameters of development really are. In some people, there will be a greater concentration of developmental problems. This may be because their specific circumstances were worse, or because they were more sensitive, deeply affected by conditions that others with more robust temperaments could better withstand. They are the ones likely to be diagnosed with ADD or with some disorder. In the westernmost shores of Canada, on Vancouver Island, one sees scruffy and twisted little conifers, stunted relatives of the magnificent fir trees that dominate the landscape just a short distance inland. We would be wrong to see these hardy little survivors as having some sort of plant disease. They have developed to the maximum that the relatively harsh conditions of climate and soil allow. 
If we wish to understand why they differ so dramatically from their inland relatives, we need to know under what conditions majestically tall, stout, and ramrod straight fir trees are able to thrive. It is the same with human beings. We do not have to look for diseases to explain why some people are not able to experience the fully flowering of their potential. We have only to inquire what conditions sustain unfettered human development and what conditions hinder it. The answer to underdevelopment is development, and for development, the appropriate conditions must exist. No matter how efficiently they are able to arouse the higher brain centers, medications offer only a partial solution to the problems posed by ADD. We may not be able to prescribe development directly. But we can promote an environment that makes development possible. Fortunately, as we will see when we come to the chapters on the healing process in ADD, neurological and psychological maturation can take place at any time during the life cycle, even in late adulthood.